So log into Slido. I've got how many? Two, four. there are 20 of you here, so just over 60, well, 60% 60 of you so far have responded. Now, I'm going to turn on the results and see if this affects what people do, because remember, you can change your answer. So currently, on which of the following are measures of efficiency of a propulsion system? 42% of you have said A to propulsive. 42% have said A to thermal. 33% have said specific fuel consumption. 25% have said specific thrust. 17% have said A to propeller. 17% have said specific thrust specific fuel consumption. And 17% have said specific impulse. Or is that 17% of the answer? Nope. Oh. Data propellers now up to 23%. Oh, down again. While we're sitting here doing this, um, there's two questions about the systems activity. Remember, you do need to upload both your slides and your two sides of A4 to the group file exchange. This is so everybody has access to them when they take the quiz. And the quiz is due this Friday at 1800 hours. If you check your Blackboard calendar, it should be visible there. Um, I haven't seen if anybody's had issues with the quiz so far. Um, all of the DAS plans and stuff are in place, so if you've got a DAS plan, uh, you should see the extra time based on whatever you've been given, rest breaks, toilet breaks, whatever. 15 minutes for most of us, um, and then for desk folks, you'll get your appropriate. Okay, we're up to 16 people, um, and I think we'll just give it a start now. So, which of these of the following are measures of the efficiency of propulsion system? So... I, I think the, the first ones we'll talk about are the ADAs. So ADA, propulsive, thermal, and propeller. ADA is, in propulsion systems, is our term for an efficiency. Straight up, it's an efficiency. So anytime you see ADA, if it's ADA of something related to a propulsion system, it will be an efficiency. So propulsive efficiency, thermal efficiency, and propeller efficiency are all measures of efficiency. Now, not every propulsion system will have a propeller. So some propulsion systems, this wouldn't be appropriate. So if I said I have a ramjet or a turbojet or an electric resistojet rocket, obviously I wouldn't have a propeller efficiency. So by definition, those are efficiencies. Propulsive efficiency is just the measure of how good our propulsion system is of accelerating mass flow. So it's just that relationship between the momentum going in and the momentum going out, or our thrust power. Now, what that means is it's how much kinetic energy we, we have to create to create that change in momentum, that thrust power. So propulsive efficiencies are maximized, and we'll look at this here in a second, when the difference between input velocity, in inlet velocity and exit velocity or velocity into your propeller, or velocity out of your propeller is almost zero. Zero plus, it's infinitesimal. Thermal efficiency is just how good we are at taking the, the heating energy, the heat energy, be it chemical energy in a fuel or nuclear energy in a reactor or potentially something from a solar panel and creating kinetic energy out of that. It's just that conversion. Now, unfortunately, what that means is that thermal efficiency and propulsive efficiency for things like a jet engine, a gas turbine engine, work against each other. So we want to create lots of kinetic energy for a given amount of fuel in, but at the same time, we want as minimal kinetic energy to our thrust power. A to propeller is just how good our propeller is at turning shaft power, rotational energy, into propulsive energy. Okay. So those are good. 
Now, specific fuel consumption, thrust specific fuel consumption and specific impulse are all overall means of saying how efficient our engine is at taking that input energy and generating thrust power. So they build up aid of propulsive, aid of thermal, aid of propeller where appropriate. Now, they're related in different ways. So we talk about specific fuel consumption for engines that have shaft outputs. So internal combustion piston engines, like we have in a car. They will have a specific fuel consumption. Or a turbo shaft, like we use on a helicopter. That has a specific fuel consumption. So engines or propulsion systems that are inherently power limited, air breathe, in the atmosphere, we use specific fuel consumption. Thrust specific fuel consumption is used for engines that are, th or propulsion systems that are thrust limited, i.e. turbojets, ramjets, and the like. And then specific impulse we use for space propulsion. And we'll talk about the relationship here in a minute. So therefore, unless I screwed up this, the only one that isn't is specific thrust. And I did screw it up, so let me fix that poll. Um, <laughs> I, I clicked all of them. So specific thrust is the only one that isn't, in this case, a measure of efficiency. OK? Again, it's all about how well we do at taking whatever we get in and converting it to useful momentum out the back. And we do that in the ratios of kinetic energy and the like. OK, so next question. Propeller efficiency is a function of engine power, advance ratio, or wind. Now, as we said, it's how good our propeller is So this bit here, we have a propeller, that purple bit, how good that is at importing shaft power, that rotational power, into thrust power. Now, one way you know it's not good is what? You know it's lower if your propeller makes more of what? Yeah, noise, yep. Because noise is just radiated other energy that isn't going into that stream coming out the back. Now, that being said, if you get a really low frequency kind of rumbling noise out the back, that's a, what we call jet noise. That's actually because you have shear between the outside atmosphere and that stream tube. You don't get it with propeller aircraft. There isn't enough velocity difference. But out the back of a turbojet, you get lots of that jet noise. And that is because you have a lot of momentum coming out. So that's all the propeller efficiency is. Now, obviously, it's a bit more complex than that because our propellers work by being basically a wing. So A to PR is just the ratio of shaft power to thrust power. And it's always going to be less than or equal to 1. And it's just how good we are at that. Therefore, the more work we have to do to the flow by turning it with our propeller, the lower our propeller efficiency is. And that's just because as we turn, we get more drag across that aerofoil. We're just doing more work. We get more loss and the like. And so advance ratio is really just a function of that. And that, I mean, sorry, the propeller efficiency is a function of that. That's going to be dependent on the shape of your airfoil, the angle it goes in, and the incoming stream, and we call that advance ratio. So propeller efficiency is purely a function of advance ratio. When you do propulsion, you'll talk a bit more about this. We don't go into details here. But you just need to know that it's a function of advance ratio. That is a valid question for, like, an exam or the like. Okay. So we'll kill that quiz for now. I said systems quiz is due on the uh, Friday at 1800 hours. OK, we'll open up the next poll. This is our gas turbine one. Um, and there are eh, how many questions here? Three questions. Um, and then we'll go into gas turbines and jet propulsion.
Okay. Keep going if you are still working on that. We'll show the results of first one. What happens as specific thrust increases? Now, this is a bit of a mix, but we tend to talk about this in um, jet propulsion more so than anything else. Um, but it is one of those things to remember. Specific thrust is a measure of how much thrust we get per unit mass flow. So that's mass of air or propellant, either through the propeller or through a jet engine. We talk about it most in, in terms of jets and rockets. So what that means, if we go back to the thrust equation, our simplified thrust equation, T equals m dot v jet or v out minus the v input, which is infinity for an air breathing engine or zero for a rocket. If we take T over m dot, that's just this ratio here, that difference. So the higher the specific thrust, the higher the exit velocity, therefore the higher the kinetic energy, and therefore the lower the propulsion efficiency. So as specific thrust goes up, our propulsion efficiency goes down, all else remaining equal. Therefore, our efficiency will go down. So we talk about it. We have high efficiency and low specific thrust, very high specific thrust and very low efficiency for rockets. Now, that's just on the propulsion side. You can have all sorts of other losses on the thermal side or the upstream side. So it's a bit more complex than that. But all else remaining equal, if we trade mass flow, for velocity change, that's our trade there. And specific thrust gives us higher specific thrust, gives us lower efficiency. Um, it also um, gives us uh, less life. Um, higher specific thrust engines tend to be a lot less reliable, have less life um, on them. So rocket engines, chemical rockets are used for minutes at a time. Even reusable ones are limited in the thing. We get tens of thousands of hours on wing out of a modern gas turbine engine. Okay? Pole two. What type of, what is the simplest type of gas turbine engine? Is it a piston engine? A turbojet, a turbofan, a ramjet, a turboprop, a scramjet, or a turboshaft? Now, we need to think about what's the difference here between a jet engine and a gas turbine engine. A jet engine, by definition, is an engine or a propulsion system where the working fluid inside your engine is the same as your propelling fluid. So a rocket, a pure solid rocket, is a type of jet engine. That's a question later. A gas turbine engine is specifically an engine that has a turbine in the primary gas flow. So, turbojet, gas turbine. Turboprop, gas turbine. <coughs> turboshaft, gas turbine. But a turboshaft, ideally, we take all of that energy in our gas flow and we take it out via a turbine into a shaft, hence why it's called turboshaft. So it's not a jet engine. So we know this isn't the right answer. Is a piston engine, a gas turbine? Not really. Obviously, if we put a turbo supercharger on it, there's a bit of a gas turbine in there, but a standard piston engine isn't. So now we want to know of these, and which one is the simplest type of gas turbine? So. Is it a turbojet, turbofan, ramjet, or scramjet? Anybody have thoughts? So 25% of you said turbojet, 13% said ramjet. And of course, the answer, of course, is, as we said, a turbojet. And the reason it's a turbojet is all we have is a simple gas flow. We don't have gearboxes, we don't have offtakes in the ideal sense. Now, why is a ramjet or a scramjet, supersonic combustion ramjet, not a gas turbine? Anybody know? 
Yeah. Yeah, they have no moving parts. They literally are just the simple suck it in, squeeze, compress the air via ram effect. And that is your dynamic pressure equation. So one half rho v squared or one half uh, p gamma m squared where you have Mach number. And then they burn it and they expand it. So remember, jet engines follow the suck, squeeze, bang, blow principle. We suck it in through a diffuser. We compress it either by the stream tube in a ramjet or a physical compressor that does work. We burn or fuel or add heat. So you could have a nuclear thermal jet engine. Great idea. Running around with a giant nuclear reactor pile spewing out radioactive waste. Um, it was, by the way, an idea the Americans had in the 50s. They were going to build a cruise missile that would be fly around. It contained, I think, three five megaton thermonuclear bombs. And then when it was done dropping those, it would just keep flying around and radiating everything uh, until it either mechanically failed or someone shot it down. Um, and then we extract work if we have a mechanical compressor in the turbine and exhaust it through a nozzle. OK. What is the simplest type of jet engine? And 58% of you said uh, ramjet. Now, if I had put scramjet on here, it would have also been appropriate. Uh, they are a bit more complex in terms of your design, but in terms of operation, they're just a tube that you compress the flow, you jump fuel in, you heat it up, and you, you uh, ignite it. Um, also, perfectly acceptable to put solid rocket. Just a tube with propellant inside and a nozzle on the end. No more sophisticated than a ramjet. Um, so rockets are also jet engines. Okay. Okay. Do we have any questions? What do you mean by ram effect? Okay, so it's a term introduced now. So when flow is moving, it has energy and has momentum. If I stop that flow, bring it from a velocity, say 100 meters per second, 300 meters per second, 1,000 meters per second, to a stop, that momentum and kinetic energy will get transferred into the energy and temperature, temperature and pressure that we measure, what we call static temperature. Those are what we call our total or stagnation values. That conversion of slowing it down and changing our bulk motion into what we call what's random motion, essentially, that is called the ram effect. So if I have a lot of energy, a lot of dynamic pressure, a lot of dynamic temperature, and I slow it down and convert that into the equivalent static form, that's the ram effect. So I can raise the pressure of the flow, especially through a shock, by multiples, you know, two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten, easily. Um, that's the ram effect. Okay. So, um, last. On space. Okay, so which of the following is a monopropellant rocket? Is it a hydrazine rocket, an H2O2 rocket, an MMH N204, RP1 LOX, or LH2 LOX? Now, obviously, 68% of you said hydrazine. Very few percent of you have said these three at the bottom, and 47% said H2O2. Now, the giveaway in this question is... Those top two have one thing in them, and the other ones have combinations. So these are going to be, by definition, bipropellant. So they're not good. A monopropellant rocket is simply a rocket that works by the disassociation of a chemical into reactant gases on its own. So you need an unstable chemical. Hydrazine's a great one. It's relatively stable until you introduce a catalyst. 
and then it disassociates, and you get a lot of gas, big expansion, pressure increase, you can get the rocket. Another one is H2O2, which, by the way, is also a correct answer. Oh, anybody know what H2O2 is? Yeah. Hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is inherently unstable. Um, there's too many oxygens in it. And so it will, over time, it will react and create water and free oxygen. If you have very, very high concentrations of H2O2, store it at slightly below room temperature, it's relatively stable. Pass it across a catalyst or a small heating element, and it disassociates rapidly. So it is the quote unquote one of the ideas for a green storable monopropellant. Um, because hydrazine's highly toxic, it contaminates things around it. Oh, by the way, while it's toxic, it's really one of those things that's kind of toxic over time. This dinitrogen tetroxide, also known as just nitrogen tetroxide, really nasty right away. Um, and the like. So, a number of years ago, there was a project. The U.S. Uh, nuclear deterrent relies on the Minuteman missile and the post-boost vehicle that, fly, that guides and drops off the warheads, the, re the entry vehicles, um, is hydrazine powered. And they wanted to create an environmentally friendly weapon of mass destruction. So um, they were looking at H2O2. Um, it, it seems a bit of a, a, a oxymoronic statement to call an environmentally friendly ICBM. But when you realize that ICBMs are actually designed not to be used, um, they're designed to be ready to be used at any point. Um, it's the contamination and the damage they do both to the people that service them and the environment in which they're stored that we worry about. Um, RP1, anybody know what RP is? Anybody know what RP stands for? Yeah. No, close. It's P is propellant, by the way. What do we think R is in this case? Yeah. Yeah, it's rocket propellant. RP-1 is a synthetic kerosene that the Americans use. The, the Russians have a similar syn kerosene. I can't remember what they call it. Um, the other thing, it comes from a mil spec, which is a uh, US military DOD spec. Uh, that's why it's RP. Um, anybody know what the equivalent fuel for a jet engine would be? Not, not the number, but the first two letters. Huh? JP. Yep, JP. So you'll hear about JP5, JP7, JP8. Um, okay, so that's RP. So this is a kerosene. Uh, LOX is liquid oxygen. So that's, our, that's really the quote-unquote standard commercial, you know, civil space rocket launch vehicle fuel. Nice thing about it is it's easy to deal with kerosene. We have lots of it. Um, liquid oxygen's not too bad. It's quite reactive, but not too bad. Um, it's not storable. The kerosene is. The oxygen will boil off over time, but it's relatively efficient. So it's what's used in the first stage of the Atlas V, the Soyuz uh, Falcon 9. LH2 is a different beast. That's liquid hydrogen. This is a truly cryogenic rocket. So both of the propellants are cryogenic. That's a semi-cryogenic rocket. LH2 liquid hydrogen, really efficient. It's the second most efficient chemical propulsion system, LH2 LOX, that we can devise. Anybody know what the most efficient chemical by propellant propulsion system would be? So hydrogen, we can't get any lighter than hydrogen as our fuel. Anybody know a better oxidizer than oxygen? Yeah. No? So we're going to go on the periodic table. We want to go as far to the right as possible and not hit the noble gases. So we don't want helium, xenon, argon, because they don't react. Anybody know what the next one to the right of oxygen is? There's one more before you get to the noble. Fluorine. 
chlorine. So the most efficient bipropellant chemical rocket would be LH2 fluorine. The problem is, while LOX and LH2 produce water, which is pretty benign, hydrofluoric acid's pretty nasty stuff. So we wouldn't want to be producing that. And fluorine on its own is also highly toxic. I mean, oxygen's toxic, but this is toxic. Okay. This bottom one, MMH. Anybody remember what MMH is? It's a form, it's a derivative of that top one. So it's a hydrazine. MMH is monomethyl hydrazine, so it's a an extended, more stable version of hydrazine. It is no good as a monopropellant. It doesn't disassociate well enough. The other one you'll hear about is what's called UDMH, which is unsymmetric, unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine. Um, and then 204. The beauty of these is these are what are known as hypergolic propellants. You just mix the two of them together, and they naturally combust. So you don't need an igniter. They also store really well. We can leave them in situ for a long time. So before the advent of solid rockets for missiles, we use those. Um, proton rocket, the Russian proton rocket, is a UDMH N204 rocket. Um, I like to call it a flying toxic waste dump uh, because it is just nasty, nasty stuff. The Titan. Uh, missiles and rockets that the U.S. used to use. So Gemini was launched on a Titan. They used um, Titans for launching things like Voyager 1 and 2 um, and the like. Those were a mixture of UDMH and pure hydrazine in N204. This is what MMH N204, this is what a lot of the storable upper stages used. It's what the orbital maneuvering system on the space shuttle used because it stores very well. Um, and the like. So those are hypergolic bipropellant rocket. Okay. Ah, we talked about this back at the efficiency. What's the relationship between ISP, specific impulse, and TSFC? And we've, so ninety percent of you said one is the inverse of the other. That is the basic relationship. Obviously. Depending what units you get TSFC in, you will need a G in there because the consistent unit set for thrust-specific fuel consumption is ki um, kilograms of fuel per newton of thrust per second or something like that. Um, and ISP is just pure seconds. So you can't just invert it. You have to do that conversion with G to get mass and uh, force. Um, if you use inconsistent units for uh, uh, TSFC, which is you'll hear quoted a lot, that's kilograms mass per kilogram force per hour, or just one over hour, then you just have to convert hours to seconds and flip it over. Okay? It's really useful. So, I want a more efficient rocket. I quoted an ISP. Do I want my ISP to be higher or lower? With ISP, is more efficient, higher, or lower? Higher. So 400 seconds is less efficient than 800 seconds, than 3,000 seconds. For TSFC, I want it to be more efficient is lower. So 0.25 is better than 1. 1, a TSFC of 1 per hour is 3,600 seconds, ISP. So that's that crossover. So a typical... High bypass ratio gas turbine engine at cruise may have a TSFC of around 0 0.5. That's 7,200 seconds. Space shuttle main engine, one of the most efficient chemical rockets, launch vehicle rockets we've ever built, devised. That's 470 seconds ISP. You're talking more than 10 times the efficiency, basic efficiency. And that's all because one, has a very low specific thrust, one a very high specific thrust. But the other reason is why jet engines are always going to be more efficient than chemical rockets is we get our oxidizer from the atmosphere so we don't have to carry it around. Okay. Chemical rockets are a type of jet engine. 
Uh, we gave that away. Yes, so are technically electrical rockets. Um, the working fluid is the propelling fluid. Okay, which of the below are types of electrical space propulsion systems? Ion engines, resisto jets, Hall effect thrusters, nuclear or chemical rockets. Um, quite simply, everyone but the last two are. A chemical rocket is by definition not electric. Nuclear. There are two basic types of nuclear rockets. There are nuclear thermal, which would not be electrical, and nuclear electric, where we use a nuclear reactor to generate electricity, and then we use that to do an ion, a resisto, or a Hall effect. Okay? The beauty of electric space propulsion systems is they are quite efficient. They have, relatively speaking, a very high ISP, especially if we use very low mass propellants or, you know, ejection gases. Um, the trade is, instead of being thrust limited like a chemical rocket, they go to being power limited. So you need some really significant power systems to generate lots of thrust. So we usually talk about micro and millinewtons for most of our electric propulsion systems versus meganewtons for some of our chemical rockets. Okay? Uh, and then there's one more. Solid rocket motors, no, uh, motets as I said, are bipropellant systems and that is true. Um, solid rockets use both a propellant and uh, an oxidizer, a fuel and an oxidizer. They're just usually pre-mixed in a solid form in a binder. So the common, two most common um, propellant combinations for solid rockets is HTPB, which I can't remember what it stands for. It's a polybutadiene, I think. And AP, which is ammonium perchlorate, which is the oxidizer. Um, we also get p band AP, and then we often dope it with things like aluminium and the like for increased thrust with a loss of efficiency. Um, they use that in um, missiles and stuff to get really high, high thrust. Okay? Okay. Um, that's that with that. Uh, we did ram effect already. The pre-burner, what's the pre-burner for chemical rockets? Are they considered part of the propellant? So a pre-burner is usually there for the purpose of generating some form of gas um, at a lower temperature and pressure that we use for maybe running a turbo pump to pressurize our fuel system. It may be um, to do it, we do that stoichiometric, so we get more energy, it's more efficient, but then we do the, the main burn in either fuel rich or oxygen rich to keep it cool. So it's those type of things. So um, we have pre-burners, but they're doing different bits. Depending on how we eject that flow from the rocket, do we eject it into the main nozzle stream or do we eject it to the side, it will be part of the propellant or it might not be. If it's in the main flow, it is propellant. We're using that to, as thrust. If we're just venting it to the side for no thrust, then it, it isn't, that stuff isn't considered part of the propulsion, propellant. It's part of the working of the propulsion. Okay. How do liquid rockets maintain pressure? Is there ascending and consuming propellant? Many different ways. Our big launch vehicles all use turbo pumps, pumps or electric pumps and some of the smaller um, ones for, for like micro satellites. Um, upper stages and storable things often use pressurized gas. So they have helium at 10,000 bar in some cases um, in a tank and they vent that into the, the fuel tank and it crushes and keeps the pressure up. And that's how they do it. So it just depends on the rocket and the way you do it. Next year in space systems, you'll talk more about that. Um, if an increased bypass ratio decreases thrust, decreases specific thrust, um, how do engines like the GE9X and stuff with bypass ratios around 10 to 1 achieve high thrust? So the specific thrust goes down. So to get the same thrust or more thrust, we just increase the mass flow. And the hundreds of kilograms per second of airflow through a modern high bypass ratio gas turbine. Um, it's massive. I mean, the, the fuel is tens of kilograms per second. So a GE90... 
uh, dash 115, which has a bypass ratio of around eight, seven to eight. Um, that's 115,000 uh, pounds of thrust at takeoff. What's that? Five, 500 kilonewtons of thrust. That's, and that's mostly through just mass of air. Okay. Um, why do some rockets release emissions along with the flame? And what does full flow stage combustion engine mean? Okay. So uh, keep in mind, if you see a flame, a glowing flame, that is emissions. That's what that is. If it's orange, an orange flame is usually uh, carbon monoxide combining with free oxygen to form carbon dioxide. A blue flame is hydrogen peroxide ions, OH, combining with oxygen to form water vapor. Um, you can have other colors, but in those two types of rockets, that's what it is. You also get a lot of smoke, um, especially from solid rockets, and that's just because of the, the, the combinations of crap that rubber and ammonium perchlorate produce. You can get even more soak if, smoke if you dope it with things like aluminum or magnesium to increase your thrust. Full flow stage combustion means um, that you have multiple stages of combustion, so you burn, maybe burn rich and the like, but in the end, you're burning stoichiometric. So most rocket engines are either fuel rich or oxidizer rich, um, but you lose efficiency for that. You don't get all the energy you can. So a full flow stage combustion talks about how you do the combustion. That's the stage. And full flow means it's not, at the end, it's neither fuel nor oxidizer rich. Um, and that is kind of a holy grail um, if uh, engines, but if they're a lot harder to get right. Um, comparing launching from the ground, does air launches, i.e. Virgin, uh, Virgin uh, orbits, or Pegasus like require higher thrust or lower ISP to work. So the purpose of launching at altitude is to primarily reduce your drag losses. Because we're at 40,000 feet or whatever, 12,000, 13,000 meters. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a lot less atmosphere. You get less drag losses as you accelerate lower Q. Um, we use the aircraft with very, very high ISP to get us up there. Um, we can also, therefore, state launch from where we want to. We can go to the right latitude, same inclination, and the like more easily. Um, as such, we need less thrust, and we can start with a motor that's more tuned to high altitude. So we can get more efficient uh, motor design with those stages. Uh, you don't see it very often. There's a lot of extra infrastructure. It's not as, and you have to carry it around with you, which is why you don't see that many air launches. Um, but it's always uh, been an idea. So we can, we can use higher ISP motors, all else remaining equal, um, and get over the drag losses. We get a little bit of gravity loss benefit because you're already up 12,000 meters, but not as much as we get drag benefit. And what's a motet? A motet is a motor when I can't type. Um, so that's what it is. So that's why. Okay. One last open text poll. Um, and this one's a more interesting one. This is an aviation-related thing, but it also has um, something. It was just something the university sent out yesterday. Uh, got, made me think, see if you can figure this one out. So, yeah. So what's the difference between a regulation and guidance? And we asked this, obviously, all stuff with the coronavirus and all of that brings it to force. But in aviation and space, we use this a lot. Regulations, so or statutes or laws, however you want to call it, they are rules that you have to follow. So when we talk about certification of um, commercial aircraft in the US, we have what are called the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations. They are law. You must adhere to them. You must meet that. They use words like must or shall. The applicant shall do X or shall demonstrate X. Guidance is specifically, well, there's also guidance navigation and the like. Guidance documents, which the CIA issues, the FAA issues, the ASA issues, they are there as a means of helping you meet the regulations, but a guidance is neither necessary nor sufficient to guarantee that you are complying. You can follow guidance to the T and still be breaking the law. 
Um, and you can also ignore the guidance and meet the law, because it is guidance by definition. Now, the nice thing about it is, if the CAA says, we expect this to meet the law, if you follow this guidance, it's the path of least resistance. So we almost always follow the guidance in the first order. But if you're a company like Boeing, or Airbus, or Rolls-Royce, or GE, you may have a history of practice and be able to demonstrate better ways for you to meet that regulation than the FAA does. Because, of course, you have your own history, your technology, your own knowledge, and they have a different set. And so there may be ways that are mutually beneficial. And you basically propose what's called an alternate means of compliance. Standards are another thing in there a little bit different. Um, standards are ways that if you follow a standard, it is technically sufficient to meet the intent of the regulator because by definition it's a standard. However, again, it's not necessary. You can go your own way and dig your own hole. Um, we tend to use standards for things where otherwise it would be really, really hard to demonstrate compliance. We use standards for jet fuel. Jet A, there's an ASTM standard. If you follow the standard, it's acceptable everywhere. If you make a different jet fuel, technically you have to get that individually certified for every aircraft engine combination you want. So that's why we use standards. Um, so anytime you see the word must, and someone says you must follow guidance, the law says you must follow the guidance, then it's not guidance, it's a regulation. Um, it's just this weird one. And the government isn't particularly consistent on that either. But yeah, in aviation especially, guidance is not a must, and you may not actually even meet the rules if you follow it. You have to, you are the sole person as the applicant or as the operator responsible. Okay, uh, that was just a little aside. Um, next week we will be doing um, art artifacts of import. Again, see if you can figure out what's wrong from this, the videos, what's no longer correct, and um, and then obviously there's what my favorite aircraft. Okay, thanks, folks.